I'm Dawson Carr, the Janet and Richard Geary Curator of European Art, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's lecture that will examine uh, El Greco's Holy Family with Mary Magdalene, uh, on loan from, uh, to us from the Cleveland Museum of Art, the fifth in the Masterworks Portland series. Um, and this series was conceived by our, our director, Brian Ferrizzo, to bring very great works of art, the likes of which we couldn't possibly buy, even if we had the money today, uh, for you to enjoy and concentrate on in Portland. And today's lecture is meant to set this painting in context. Um, before we begin, uh, even though it's just bringing a single work of art here, um, it requires funding. And we are very grateful to the uh, sponsors who made this possible. Nanny Warren, Spencer and Mary Dick, uh, Alton and Celia Wiebe, and Linda, Linda and Donald uh, of Van Wart, along with the European and American Art Council of this museum. We decided to bring this painting here at this moment to commemorate the 400th anniversary of El Greco's death in 1614. Uh, there have been celebrations all over uh, Europe and America. Uh, displays are going on in New York and Washington as we speak. And one of the reasons that all of this has taken place this last year, and there's been this great refocus on El Greco, is his huge popularity in the modern world. He is a very rare old master in his appeal uh, to a modern audience. And this popularity is due to a, a number of factors. Um, and first and foremost, he's a passionate artist. And his passion for his art comes across in his, his work. Um, he's an artist who probes the boundaries uh, of art. And this is still perceivable. His appeal is no doubt due to his great individuality, his distinctiveness. Uh, he is unto himself, and we appreciate this in the modern world far more than it was appreciated by El Greco's contemporaries. He's easy to recognize. Once you get El Greco's style in your head, you can pick him out across a room. Um, and the hallmarks of this very distinctive style are seen in this probably his very finest devotional painting. Powerful use of color. For El Greco, color was the absolute most important aspect of, of art. And you can see it here, the colors somewhat defined uh, by the characters represented, the Madonna uh, in her rose-colored dress and blue mantle, Mary Magdalene in red, and the yellow that you see on Joseph is not necessarily uh, tied to Joseph, but it's a color that El Greco adored, and you're going to see it again and again this morning, uh, this afternoon. Also uh, evident is his elongation of form, uh, the overall forms and then the forms of the hands displayed in, in very elegant patterns, and a very indistinct space, a space that is not of this world. The figures seem to float before this turbulent sky with this uh, ray of light emanating from heaven above and breaking through. El Greco's works emanate a, a spiritual quality, one, one that's uplifting, and sometimes he's been characterized as himself a mystic. Um, he lived in the great age of the Spanish mystics. Uh, uh, St. John of the Cross and Teresa of Avila were, uh, were alive in his time, and their writings about their encounters, uh, mystic encounters with the divine, inspired this age. But El Greco was no mystic. Um, he was a very worldly man. He, he loved the good life, and he was very much engaged by the discussions of art in his time. He is an intellectual artist, and that's what I'm going to try to convey to you today. Um, one thing before we move away from this image that I want to point out to you so that as we look at other works by El Greco, you can keep this in mind. One of the things that makes it very special are those facial expressions, particularly of the Madonna and the Christ child. This is very unusual in El Greco's art, as you will see. While 
In the 20th century, some Spaniards viewed El Greco as a mystic. By the time of his death, his style was already outdated, and he was largely forgotten until toward the end of the 19th century when, as I like to say, art caught up with El Greco. And he became a, a great source of inspiration, first to Manet, then to Cezanne and the Impressionists. They all found something in Greco to inspire, whether it was dazzling brushwork, his abstractions of form, or his emphasis on two-dimensional design. And he became venerated, and we still venerate him, as a great harbinger of modernism. And we need to be careful about this. Uh, uh, and I just want to show you a sequence of slides here. In 1907, when Picasso was working on this seminal work in the development of Cubism, um, he was making his way across town to the studio of his, his friend, the Basque painter, Ignacio Zuluaga, who owned the opening of the Fifth Seal of the Apocalypse, now in the Metropolitan Museum. And, and as you can see, Picasso was fascinated uh, by those figures of martyrs throwing off, uh, throwing off their earthly cloaks to receive uh, the, 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 the white robe robes uh, uh, in heaven, and he uses that in and out of those forms uh, uh, to create uh, his very demonic vision of these whores from Avignon um, a, a, with the dra uh, emanating from the drapery, and you can see Greco's love of those inverted Vs, uh, the arms raised, ma make it into the composition as well. And so you knew about Cezanne and African art influencing this, uh, this picture, but El Greco was also a profound influence on Picasso as well at this moment. There are literal quotes uh, of El Greco's works, Modigliani doing the painter Paul Alexandra here. And of course, Greco was immensely influential on the German Expressionists. Uh, Julius Meyer Grefe uh, publishes his Spanish Journey in 1910, and painters start to German painters start to look uh, at his works. And here you see Max Beckmann uh, very much picking up on it, not only the elongation, uh, but the use of these very, very dramatic and stylized gestures as well. American artists, too, were influenced by El Greco. Here's Thomas Hart Benton from the America Today series uh, with those sinuous, elongated figures and, and wild juxtapositions of space. And Benton instilled a great love of El Greco on one of his pupils, um, Jackson Pollock. Um, in fact, uh, 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 Pollock's love for the old masters was the only thing that he was willing to attribute positively to his experience with Benton. Um, and more than anything, any other artist in Pollock's sketchbooks, one finds him copying El Greco. He didn't know this resurrection in the original. He was copying it out of books, and you can see him fascinated with the energy uh, of El Greco's linear design. And traces of this can be felt as he develops into the artist, uh, it develops his singular uh, style of abstract expressionism. The artist with whom they were so fascinated, um, we know as El Greco. The Spanish article El, uh, the masculine article El, combined with the Italian noun uh, Greco. Um, this is, was only used after his death. Um, it's become commonplace now. His real name was Domenicos Theotokopoulos. And he was born on Crete, the largest of the Greek islands, in 1541. Theotokopoulos is a mouthful to get out. And so in Italy, he became known as Il Greco, the Greek. Uh, and in Spain, he always signs his name, his real name, uh, uh, Domenicos Theotokopoulos. But he became known and was written about as Domenico Greco, and that is the source. He's not El Griego in Spain, which is Spanish uh, for the Greek. He began his career as a writer of Byzantine icons. Iconographers prefer the term writing because of its relationship with the word being made flesh, God being made flesh. And um, 
here you see one of his icons, obviously very badly damaged, but I show you this image of St. Luke painting uh, the Virgin for a reason. Um, it was, of course, not recorded in the Gospels that he painted. It's from the apocryphal literature that Luke paints uh, the authentic portrait uh, of the Virgin Mary and the Christ child. And this form became known as the Hodicatria, or the Virgin Hodicatria. Hodicatria means she who shows the way, and here she's indicating the Christ child as the source of salvation. And this original by El Greco, was, uh, by uh, St. Luke, was believed brought to Constantinople in the fifth century. Um, by the time of El Greco, it was long gone, either uh, 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 destroyed by the Ottomans or, uh, according to some, taken off to Russia. Um, it inspired countless images because of its relationship with the divine. It, each image that was faithfully reproducing this type carried a bit of the sanctity uh, of the original. And here you find a contemporary, slightly younger contemporary of El Greco uh, to illustrate that point. Whether, it, it, Icon painting is a very self-referential art. There is a great deal of freedom involved to the individual artist who approaches it in a prayerful manner, but it follows types, and maybe this was a bit constricting for El Greco. We don't know the real reasons, but in 1567, he leaves Crete, and he makes his way to Venice. Venice uh, had, uh, Crete had been a possession of the Republic of Venice since the early 13th century, and so it was a natural progression. And in Venice, he transforms his art. He becomes a master of Italian mannerism, uh, the style that follows the, the, the high Renaissance, as we see in this rendering of the purification uh, uh, of the temple, Christ uh, driving the traitors from the temple. And I just want to quickly illustrate that this did not happen to all Cretan iconographers who made their way to Venice. Here are two of the very finest of El Greco's uh, contemporaries who go to Venice, they work in the Church of San Giorgio dei Greci there, but Italian style really makes no impact. Greco wanted to become something else, and his chief source of inspiration in a Venice was Tintoretto. Um, here you see Tintoretto's miracle of the slaves. El Greco is not only learned about a uh, uh, linear perspective, but he's principally learning how to express with the human figure in these very complex, interlocking designs, a la Tintoretto. We know that Tintoretto was one of El Greco's favorite artists. And the way we know this is that in 1969, a copy of Vasari's Lives of the Painters was discovered at a bookseller in London. And containing copious annotations by El Greco. So we know a lot about what he thought about other artists and what he thought about art. Um, I'm happy to report that these three volumes uh, entered the National Library in Madrid just at, uh, at the end of December last year at the whopping price of 300,000 euros. But it's been in private hands all this time and not accessible. And within a few months, we hope to see uh, a digitized version online so that everyone can peruse and make use of this uh, extraordinary uh, uh, source. While El Greco has come a great way here, he's not all the way there in the use of oil as a, a medium. Um, he's still, it's painted, this is painted in oil, and I haven't told you, I think it, maybe I indicated it before, it's in the National Gallery of Art in Washington. Um, it's painted in oil, but using the short, unblended strokes of a tempera painter, what he had known in his, um, his making of icons. And in 1570, El Greco leaves Venice and goes off for a time in Rome where he paints another version of this composition. And there you see it. It's in the Minneapolis Institute of Arts. And 
the figures have become more monumental, the design has become clearer, the architecture too, uh, much, much more monu uh, monumental. And this is El Greco under the influence of central Italian mannerism, uh, particularly uh, as represented in the art of Michelangelo. Here you see uh, the last judgment on uh, of the wall of the Sistine Chapel. Um, in El Greco's time in Rome in the early uh, 1570s, um, this is just after the closing of the Council of Trent in, uh, in 1563, and a certain prudism uh, has entered the picture. Uh, style is being played way down, and the decision is taken to give these nude figures loincloths. And the call goes out for a painter, and El Greco volunteers for the job, but suggests that they let him tear the whole thing down and paint it right. <laughs> now, you can imagine how this went over in Rome, um, especially from this young Greek, and it illustrates something about Greco. He was extremely arrogant, and uh, this, is, this is known throughout his, uh, his career in Italy and Spain. And to develop the kind of style that he do, did, it took an artist a very, very great self-confidence. Um, I'm going to show you that central figure group with that, that, that twirling figure of Christ uh, saving and damning uh, uh, at the same moment. Uh, and that energy in that figure and the variety, the huge variety of poses that one finds in Michelangelo. Nothing is, could be possibly be too contorted um, as Michelangelo sought uh, to express his particular vision of beauty. And you see that tension in that figure in, in uh, the Christ driving the traitors from the temple. In this picture, down in the lower uh, right-hand corner, you will find a visual footnote. El Greco is, is listing his sources in the creation of uh, this image, and they are, from left to right, Titian, Michelangelo, the miniature painter Giulio Clovio, who I will uh, show you in an independent portrait by El Greco next, and Raphael, somewhat surprisingly, although he loved Raphael's color harmonies and uh, his design as well. There's Giulio Clovio again, the great miniaturist. He was a Croatian and adopted El Greco, a foreigner in, in Rome, and, and got him lodgings in the Palazzo Farnese. Um, and I just, he's holding his greatest work, the Farnese Hours there. I'm going to show it to you very briefly um, uh, to illustrate that this manner of style and its, its elongated figures, complex figure design, um, and a certain emphasis on two-dimensionality is also true in manuscript illumination. Uh, Clovio is really the last of the great manuscript illuminators, and I'll remind you, it's a, it's a really small book executed on a small scale, a rather extraordinary thing. Well, El Greco opens a workshop in Rome, enters the guild, um, but he gets no major commissions. A few people buy intellectuals, uh, of friends of, of Clovio and the like, buy his works, but he's getting nowhere. And so he takes the decision to leave Rome and to go off to Spain. And his primary object is this building, just completed, the Escorial. It's about 30 miles outside Madrid. It's the pantheon of the Spanish Habsburgs, a great monastery, palace, and church complex built by Philip II. And he's decorating it at this moment. And El Greco hopes for work. And indeed, he gets it from the king. And he paints these two works for Philip II. On the left, the martyrdom of St. Morris and the Theban Legion. On the right, an allegory of the Holy League, the uh, group of the uh, Doge of Venice with his back to us uh, in the foreground, Philip II uh, in black uh, to the right and behind the Pope, the, the, this group that got together and thwarted the Turks at Lepanto in 1571. Well, this is all that El Greco painted uh, for the king. We don't know what happened there. Uh, there was certainly a lot of work to be had. And it's probably that there was too much style in El Greco. These strange 
the strange body armor, queer ass uh, hugging the body, um, the great ju the juxtaposition, the bizarre juxtapositions of space, and these fantastic uh, renderings of clouds and the like, perhaps a little too distinctive and stylish for the king. His arrogance may have played a role as well. This is the high altar, a portion of the high altar at the Escorial, and I use it. In the center, at the bottom, you see Pellegrino Tibaldi. He's a great Bolognese mannerist, doing uh, uh, St. Lawrence on the grill, being martyred on, on the grill. St. Lawrence, the monastery, is dedicated to St. Lawrence. And all around, all of the other pictures are by Federico Zucchero, who gives El Greco that copy of the Sari. El Greco records this on the title page, uh, that it was gifted to him by Zucchero. And you see this brand, it's called by art historians, reformed mannerism. And it's mannerist, but very prosaic. Couldn't be more prosaic. Boring, in fact, um, in, in, these, in these, but they're very, very clear. And this was a reaction to mannerism going on back in Italy, and it would eventually lead to realism. Perhaps just a bit too much style. Eventually, El Greco settles in the great imperial city of Toledo, in the heartland uh, of Castile. Um, here you see it. It sits uh, on this great promontory at an oxbow in uh, the River Tagus, and naturally defensible. There were Bronze Age settlements here. Rome, the Romans were here, and El Greco settles there. Here's the Bisagra Gate, uh, the, the gateway put up by the Emperor Charles V with his arms on it, um, and the Alcazar, the royal palace uh, in the city where Charles V received Hernán Cortés to receive his reports on the conquests uh, uh, in America. By the time El Greco gets to Toledo, um, the court, which had been peripatetic, had been settled in Madrid by uh, 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 Philip II. And Madrid is uh, uh, 35 miles away uh, to the north and allowed a lot of open land for development and the like. And Toledo might have been forgotten, except that it was the seat of the Spanish church. Um, the Archbishop of Toledo, here's the cathedral. Um, the Archbishop of Toledo was the primate of Spain. It was a great uh, center for intellectual churchmen and they are really the ones who adopted El Greco and understood him and appreciated him. There's a shot of the interior of a, a, one of the great Gothic cathedrals in Spain. And do, do go at some point. You'll enjoy it hugely. Beautiful, narrow streets, no traffic. And if you can, stay overnight. People come in from Madrid. It's mostly day tourists. And if you stay overnight, you'll have it to yourself. And it's a bit of magic. From the outset, he produces masterwork after masterwork in Toledo. Something clicked there. Something clicked with him. He knew he was better than anyone uh, in Spain at that moment working. And he felt a, a degree of freedom to explore art uh, along his own lines. And this is the great assumption of the Virgin from Santo Domingo el Antiguo, uh, uh, completed by 1579, and it's now in the Art Institute of Chicago. It was bought by Chicago on the advice of Mary Cassatt. We see this soaring figure uh, of the Madonna tilting up as she, as she uh, rises he heavenward, and this tomb in bizarre perspective, uh, organized again much more with reference to the surface of the painting than wanting to indicate a real recession into space. And I'm going to juxtapose this now with Titian's Assumption of the Virgin, painted for the Church of the Frari in Venice, in, 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 finished in 1518. So a bit before, but it gives you a nice juxtaposition between a high Renaissance work, rational, balanced uh, and clear, and the instability and tension that was desired uh, by mannerist artists in El Greco. Also those fabrics, much as in the fabrics in the painting upstairs at the moment, um, these are not 
real fabrics that we get a sense of in the Titian. Uh, they're, they're, they're fabrics that have a life all of their own, and a light truly all of its own as well, not naturalistic like Titian. Completed just about the same time is this work, The Disrobing of Christ, which El Greco painted for the sacristy of the Cathedral of Toledo. The sacristy is the place where the priests uh, uh, don and uh, uh, take off their robes. And so this subject was deemed eminently appropriate. And you see uh, the figure of Christ in the center. I, how many heads tall, immensely tall, and this great, great area of red announcing uh, the bloody passion that is to come. The Virgin and the, the other Marys in the foreground watching as, as a hole is bored into the cross. Um, and the whole composition pushed up, the crowd pressing on him from behind. I just wanted to uh, briefly throw up another great Mannerist work, um, obviously from much earlier, uh, 1528. This is Pantormo's deposition in the Church of Santa Felicita in Florence, uh, where you see the importance of two-dimensional design on the surface. The composition, not a rational space at all. The figures also very uh, elongated. And that beautiful, beautiful, sinuous, languid line, uh, very beautifully expressing this moment where the Virgin swoons and up in the sky uh, a kind of cardboard cloud like a piece uh, of stage scenery. As I said, there's just succession after succession of masterworks. This is the burial of the Count of Orgas, uh, uh, painted between 1586 and 88 for the parish church of Santo Tome in Toledo. This was El Greco's parish. And it illustrates a legend. The Count of Orgas uh, died at the beginning of the 14th century and was renowned for his charity and his good works. Um, the charity, in part, financed the church. He left a great deal to the Church of Santa Tome. And in El Greco's time, the parish priest decided to commemorate uh, this good work with this painting uh, to be displayed over the Count's tomb. Legend had it that he was so holy a man that at his burial, Saints Augustine and Stephen descended from heaven to assist. And here you see them in the foreground uh, lifting the body of the Count into his tomb. And it is a bipartite composition divided in half earthly realm below, heavenly realm above, and look at the difference. This is like a manifesto of El Greco's art. Um, down below, the gallery of mourners represent portraits of, of men from El Greco's time. We can identify some of them because he painted independent portraits of them. And that's the parish priest in that translucent uh, uh, vestment uh, just to the right of St. Saint, uh, Saint Augustine. And the boy in the foreground indicating uh, this act of, uh, uh, this miraculous act uh, that to repay the charity of, of uh, the Count of Orgas is in all likelihood El Greco's son, born in a common law marriage, uh, from a common law marriage. His name was Jorge Manuel, we'll come back to him a bit later. Um, and that gallery of portraits, we've already seen El Greco, in spite of the fact that he's a very anti-naturalist artist in many ways, he's a magnificent portraitist. And even Saints Augustine and Stephen, they're down in the earthly realm, and so they're rendered like the others. And then you have only to look up into heaven. The soul of the Count is being carried up through the middle of the composition, where the figure style changes completely color, the clouds have a life of, uh, of their own. This stylization, this development of this figure style had to do with representations of the divine. And they were, in this instance, reserved for the heavenly realm and very much um, uh, uh, are a part of this, this juxtaposition of worlds. The Spaniards were very well disposed to this. There was a, 
there is throughout Spanish literature and art a trend of transcendentalism. And the belief, of course, originates in the fundamental Christian belief in, in life after death, that there is a better realm. Um, but it comes out in all sorts of ways. And one way that I think most of you will remember is Cervantes. Don Quixote is published uh, in 1605, not long, El Greco's still alive. And if you remember, when Cervantes tells his tale, there's story within story within story within story. Sometimes you don't know quite where you are, and then Cervantes brings you back into the main line uh, of the narrative. Um, and so they were very well disposed to this artist and this kind of juxtaposition. Now, taking you back to his former self. This is an icon discovered on the Greek island of Syros in 1983 and signed by El Greco as the Saint Luke that I showed you before. It has a signature on it, so we know it's his, um, depicting the dormition of the Virgin, the, literally the going to sleep of the Virgin. Uh, you see her uh, dying, going to sleep down below, and, and there she is enthroned up in, up in heaven, these two realms. Um, and I thought you might like to see that, and especially to remind you of those flashing highlights as you look uh, at El Greco's play of, of, of light in his later works. This kind of composition was not just known in icon painting at all. It was also, also uh, known in the West, this, this uh, two-part composition. Now I'm jumping way ahead from 1588, and this is the very end of El Greco's life, uh, and he's painting this for his own tomb. Um, it's in the Prado today, this adoration uh, uh, of the shepherds, and in all likelihood, uh, that's a self-portrait of El Greco kneeling with his back to us. And if that figure stood up, you can imagine how tall he would be. And I, I remind you regarding this elongation that it was not just true of El Greco. Here's the, the Madonna that is now called the Madonna of the Long Neck for obvious reasons, uh, with these great elongations of form and this mannerist uh, 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 juxtaposition of two spaces that don't seem really connected at, uh, connected at all, only in the realm of art. But look at the date. El Greco is a very, very late manifestation of this style. One other aspect of mannerism was, in some places, the use of facture, the use of brushwork to emphasize the creative act. And I'm going to take you in slowly into this. You can already begin to see all but abstract. Now this is very different than ours. In a painting, this is a, a large painting, in a painting, the scale of the one from Cleveland, the Holy Family with, uh, with Mary Magdalene, you find a much more restrained use of brushwork, but it's there nonetheless, and I hope you're up there savoring it. This is the Pentecost, uh, uh, painted about 1600 uh, for the College of Doña Maria de Aragon in Madrid, uh, one of a six works now in the Prado uh, from that altarpiece, and you can see this immense facture uh, done to emphasize facility uh, at art. And I take you back to the resurrection that from the same, frame, same series. Um, these are works about 14, 15 feet tall. Uh, I should tell you that. Um, and I want you to focus on that figure. Christ has, has all, uh, shot out of the tomb here, and, and soldiers are thrown back. And, and I want you to focus on that figure in the foreground, uh, 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 who's landed back on the ground. And I just want to remind you that just a year after El Greco finishes this, back in Rome, Caravaggio is painting this. This is the conversion of Saul, the conversion of St. Paul uh, from the Chirazi Chapel in Santa Maria del Popolo. And here we have a real light, a believable uh, light, a uh, supernatural, yes, but believable. Uh, Paul has been thrown from his horse uh, by this blinding vision. And one of my favorite things about this painting is the horse looking around to wonder what's going on and picking up the hoof 
so, so as not to hurt, uh, 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 hurt the fallen man. The point being that El Greco is off in Toledo, he has no competition there, and he has, has an audience that truly appreciates what he does. Back in Italy, his style would have seemed really, really out of date uh, at this time. But just down the street from El Greco in Toledo, there was a painter uh, 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 practicing a realist art. He's one of the first independent still life painters, Juan Sanchez Gotan. Many of you will remember this treasure of the, uh, 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 down in San Diego in this artful disposition of these fruit uh, on this, uh, the, this fruit on this ledge. And there's the same painter doing the Immaculate Conception. Look at the lovely, realistic flowers in the foreground, but the rest of it seems to us so staid. Um, a lovely technicolor thing, a big thing. It's in the museum in Cadiz. Um, and I'm going to show you El Greco doing the Immaculate Conception next. And what a difference. I, El Greco makes the viewer soar along with these, the, these figures. Um, they're, they're uplifting. And this one shows uh, the Immaculate Conception with the city of Toledo uh, laid out below. And there's one of the, the great uh, landscapes of the 16th century, an emblematic landscape rather than a realistic landscape of the city that adopted uh, El Greco. We're looking there at The Alcantara Bridge, a bridge put up in, in, in the year 93, ordered by the Emperor Trajan, who, by the way, was from a good Italian family, but born outside Seville at Italica. Um, and the arrangement up on the hill it, it is done for artful reasons. The Alcazar is right about there. I'm about to show you. But the tower of the cathedral would be way, way off to the right somewhere. There's the view uh, taken with a camera and we go back. And that very turbulent sky has, has generated a, a, a lot of, of interpretation and is, of course, relevant uh, to the Cleveland painting as well. I wanted to remind you, finally, uh, that El Greco is, again, a very great portrait painter. Uh, we saw this uh, uh, earlier on. Uh, but he is the picture of the Spanish Hidalgo, the Spanish noble filled with great pride and a portrait that in all likelihood is that of the painter's son, Jorge Manuel. Um, I think it, it, it certainly is. It's painted with such affection, it conveys such affection that it must be Jorge Manuel, who did become a painter. Um, his paintings are rather wooden next to those of his father. He's competent, but just. <laughs> and El Greco's only state portrait uh, showing uh, this cardinal, Nino de Guevara, Fernando Nino de, de, Geva, de Guevara, um, in his official role, uh, seated in an armchair. This is the way the pope uh, uh, was often portrayed, seated in an armchair, canted three quarters to the picture plane. Um, and it's very, very unusual that people of this era were portrayed in their eyeglasses. And it's only when you learned that Nino de Guevara was the grand inquisitor that it really comes together, focuses that gaze. And uh, it's a phenomenal portrait. It's in the Metropolitan Museum in New York. Um, beautiful, beautiful rendering of the watered silk uh, 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 robes, and that lace is rendered a la prima, directly onto the gr ground. A la prima means there's no, mod uh, there's no modeling per se. The modeling is done simply with white and the brush uh, on top of, of the, the brown ground. And a very different feeling from this ecclesiastic, Fray Hortensio Feliz Paravicino, um, who was a great poet, and clearly, El Greco uh, conveys this warm, charismatic presence of this man. But look at the chair, all the collapsing on him. That spirit, that sense of presence, that sense of personality that El Greco manages to convey in this figure um, comes out in spite 
of the great abstractions uh, of form around him. You have to wait a long time before you find a portrait like this again. Now, back to the painting. It presents a very simple scene of, with great domesticity. Um, Joseph is offering forth a, a bowl of fruit, and the Virgin has picked up uh, a couple of pieces and is handing them to the Christ child, who is a bit curious about all of this, but, but delighted nonetheless as he squirms in his mother's arms. Uh, Mary Magdalene embraces her as she looks down on this scene. There you see Joseph in that wonderful yellow that El Greco so favored. We'll come back to him. The Christ child. And I should tell you that Mannerist artists believed that the form of a flame, the undulating form of a flame, was a, an ideal, a perfect form, and one that was particularly um, useful in conveying movement. You found it in that figure of the spinning uh, Christ driving the traitors from, from the temple, and he applies it very much to the Christ child here. Now, this... Um, this scene that is meant to seem very familiar uh, to us is laden uh, with symbolism. Christians of El Greco's time would have recognized in the offering of fruit an allusion to the fruit of redemption. Christians believe uh, Christians believe that the sins of the human race were redeemed through God's offering of his only son as a sacrificial victim on the cross. And one of the allegorical roles that Christ and Mary assume is as the second Adam and Eve, the couple who would set right original sin. So, as Eve offered the apple of original sin to Adam, Mary offers the Christ child this fruit of Christian redemption, the fruit that will save mankind. And once you know this, that far-off look of Mary takes on a whole new significance. It's very rare that you see her full face and looking outward. She most often looks down in humility. And here, it's slightly tinged with sadness, as though she foresees in this simple act, uh, this simple moment in the life of a child, the unhappy end of her happy child. It was commonplace to introduce allusions to Christ's death in scenes of his infancy. And I'm going to just show you two examples from our collection. Here's the Cecco di Pietro from 1348. And the Christ child holds a goldfinch. The goldfinch was a child's pet. Uh, it was known as a, chi a child's pet kept in the home, but it was also a symbol of the passion because of the red mask of the goldfinch. The red of the mask um, uh, suggested the passion, and it became a commonplace symbol of the passion. So here you have it uh, in this sort of composition. In our uh, follower of Bronzino's composition of the Virgin and Child with the Infant Saint John the Baptist, the, the Christ Child is a Herculean form and he strides forward and grasps the cross, the, uh, the cross uh, 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 of his death. The, the reed cross was the symbol of the Baptist. And in this case, the, the Christ child grasping it means indicates his acceptance of his role and then follow it back into the Christ child other's, uh, other hand and you'll see the apple of original sin. The lamb was also the, uh, another symbol, an attribute of John the Baptist because it is John the Baptist who uh, on encountering Christ at the baptism declares et ecce agnus Dei, behold the Lamb of God. Uh, and so there once again it's a, re a reference to this sacrificial death at the end of the Christian story.
Mary Magdalene. One could interject virtually any saint into a representation uh, 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 of the Holy Family or of the Virgin and Child um, from any era. Uh, it was commonplace. But in this case, it ties in, Mary Magdalene's presence ties in with the theme of the work. Her downcast gaze here represents perhaps foreknowledge of, of, of Christ's end, but also her role as the embodiment of penitence, particularly female penitence during the Counter-Reformation. There you see a, a representation of her by El Greco. This is in the Worcester Art Museum in Massachusetts. Um, looking up, tears coming down, down her face in sorrow for sin. And so this penitential role ties in uh, with this fruit of Christian redemption theme that we've gone over. And the juxtaposition of the heads in this case only serves to emphasize the radiant purity of the mother of God in the Virgin. Joseph. Let me, no, we can't, I'm going to go back to an overall image just for a second. I fail to tell you that of all the various types of devotional imagery, images of the Madonna and child outnumber all others, even images of Christ on the cross. Immensely popular. Um, and in part, we think this is very simple, um, that it's that most people seeking to meditate would rather meditate on an image of Christ in, in the form of a child, uh, along with his interceding mother, um, than face an image of his suffering and death. It was entirely up to the discretion of the individual. Following the Council of Trent, the creation of devotional images like this was only emphasized by the church. They had, of course, the Catholic Church had been attacked by some of the Protestants, not all, some of the Protestants uh, for the idolatrous use of imagery. And so this is redefined at the Council of Trent. Bishops are urged to instruct their parishioners that the devotion is to be very clearly conveyed to the person depicted rather than to the image it itself. Um, but we've seen mostly in our very quick survey of El Greco's work, altarpieces. But this kind of devotional painting was absolutely essential to El Greco's business, as it was for all painters of the day. It was a big part of their business. Um, and images of the Holy Family were produced by El Greco far more than images of, of the, uh, the Virgin and Child by themselves. Um, and in part, this has to do with the fact that St. Joseph takes on a new role during the Counter-Reformation. He had been seen in the, throughout the Middle Ages as the old man, the old man who, who marries this, this, uh, this pregnant young girl, instructed by God to do, uh, to do so. And the only way that the, in the Middle Ages he could be imagined uh, as taking on this role is that if he were beyond needs. And in the Counter-Reformation, he all of a sudden becomes younger and a much more vital force uh, in the story. In fact, the epitome of the good father. And here you see him from the, uh, the chapel of, of San Jose in, in Toledo, uh, embracing uh, the Christ child, this, this lovely, lovely embrace. I should also point out to you that there is one naturalistic element in this painting, and that's that lovely rendering of the bowl of fruit. And this is commonplace in El Greco's work as well, where he'll insert a bit of naturalism to emphasize the special quality of, of, of these abstract, abstracted figures. Now, as for the setting, we see only the turbulent sky. El Greco certainly knew the tradition in Venice of depicting the Holy Family in, in a landscape setting, and, but he eliminates it 
all indications except for that turbulent sky. And this is very much in keeping with his work as a devotional artist, an artist who wants to focus attention on the sacred figures. And here you see his rendering of Christ carrying the cross, one of his, uh, among passion subjects, his greatest devotional uh, uh, work. And it's known in numerous versions. This one's in the Prado. There's a very great one in the Lehman Collection at the Met uh, as well. And Christ just against the open sky, again to encourage a sense of intimacy with a person uh, meditating or praying before it. Now, I'm going to take you in and show you, oh, I, I wanted to make the point that unlike the Venetian representations uh, of the Holy Family in a landscape, the composition using figures is much more like uh, this uh, uh, follower of Bronzino who's composing mainly with the figure. Um, oftentimes, devotional painters would present a simple, dark background, once again, to encourage that sense of intimacy with the viewer. And I'll take you back to Parmigianino again, another one of El Greco's uh, favorite uh, artists doing the Holy Family. Saint Zacharias down in the lower right was the father of the Baptist who's, who's kissing the Christ child. And if you think about that juxtaposition of the heads of Mary uh, and, and the Virgin and that interlocking kiss there, and that's the Magdalene bearing her ointment jar behind. Now, I'm gonna show you uh, El Greco's other representations of the Holy Family to hone in and show you how very special this one is. This is the first one he does in Spain. This is a dark slide of a beautiful painting in the Hispanic Society of America uh, in New York. It's, uh, it's on the walls of the Met in that display uh, at the moment. And you he also produced these holy families using Saint Anne, the mother uh, of the Virgin, uh, who Grandma comes in to, uh, uh, to help assist with, uh, with the Christ child and, and the Baptist bearing that little bowl of fruit. And here you can see Joseph in his two roles. Someone must have wanted the old man uh, uh, in the one on the left. This, that, that, that one is in uh, the National Gallery of Art in Washington, uh, and the one on the right is in the Prado. And you could have your figure inserted in place of St. Joseph as, the, as a donor as well. This from the Museo de Santa Cruz in Toledo. And finally, uh, his, his latest picture, uh, I think with a bit of workshop help, um, uh, in the Hospital Tavera in Toledo. This is the painting. The one on the right is a large altarpiece. It's in the National Gallery of Art in Washington. And uh, it shows uh, that he repurposed the basic group of the Madonna and Child in this context. So, I didn't think I was going to make it through all of those. Um, I do hope that you will enjoy uh, this painting while it's here. Um, as I uh, think I've told you before, it's, it's with us through Easter Day, the 5th of April, and it deserves study over a long period. It's a work that you, I keep going back to again and, and again and learning new things from it uh, at all times. I think maybe one of the things that I've forgotten to say to you uh, in this final gasp um, is look at how the, Christ, the, the drapery around the Christ child is highlighted. El Greco treats it almost abstractly as though, as though the, the, the highlights on that drapery are like rays of light emanating from an, from an aureole uh, around this sacred figure. And though the clouds are dark, foreshadowing uh, um, his death, there is that ray of light from heaven um, indicating that ultimately behind this image is, is salvation. Thank you all very much. I'd like to uh, take questions now.
We're going to wait for microphones so that everyone can hear. Here we go. Where is El Greco buried? In Toledo? In Toledo, in the, in, in the, in the church of Santo Domingo el Antiguo. And this last year, they, they had it open for the first time that I've ever been aware of. You could go down. Anyone else? I, well, thank I, you all oh, very much. Up, oh, sorry. I, sorry. I, I'm just curious whether anyone's addressed the fingers. Most, most portraits, the hand has the fingers in this kind of funny... Well, you find them in all kinds of configurations, Spock-like configurations and... This um, is most common, though. Often, often you'll see three fingers together, as here in, in, the, in, in that beautiful echoed, those echoed hands of, of the Virgin and, uh, uh, and Mary Magdalene. Um, and some see in those the symbolism of the Trinity with the three, fi uh, the three fingers. But one finds in Greco the fingers divided in all sorts of elegant ways. And again, not naturalistic ways at all. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, I was asked if this was commissioned by a church. And the answer is we don't know. It first appears at the beginning of the 18th century. It's gifted to a, a, a convent uh, in a little place called Esquivias. Um, it's, it's over near Iescas, about halfway back to Madrid. And it's a convent that was established at the beginning of the 18th century, so it wasn't made for that site. So we don't know. And in this case, it's a real mystery because it's a big, grand, really wonderful composition. Chances are it was made for someone special, and we just don't know. I would guess on balance it probably entered private hands and was probably held privately, or else we would have had some reference to it. Now, it's entirely possible that it was in, in a cloistered situation where no one saw it, um, but we just simply don't know in this case, and with a good many of El Greco's works, we don't know. With the altarpieces, of course, most of them remained in situ uh, until mo modern times. They were just left alone. And while Greco does not always survive in brilliant condition, um, the ones that you'll see, the, those big 15-foot-tall compositions from the Colegio de Doña Maria de Aragón in Madrid, uh, the resurrection, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, those were just left alone for so long, and they are in rather wonderful condition as a result. Um, the ones that were in churches tend to survive pretty well because they were just left alone and probably all but black until modern times. I was wondering if there'd ever been any speculation about the Mary Magdalene figure, if it could in fact be St. Anne, which seems to correspond with a lot of other... Because of her age, I would say that it mitigates against her mm -hmm. being St. Anne, the Virgin's mother. Um, but it's not entirely impossible. However, the Magdalene is not always shown in red by any means, but it is one of her colors. I think in this case, that downcast gaze serves two functions. Mm -hmm. At once, sorrow, looking, looking ahead to the crucifixion, and also the Magdalene's role as a pen penitential saint, looking downward. Mm -hmm. And was she that much older than the Christ child? Sorry? The Mag was the Magdalene that much older than Jesus? Uh, no, you can't think of this literally I, well, as her appearing because, of course, age, the Magdalene yeah. doesn't appear in the Christian right. story until toward the end. Yeah. Yeah. And, but it was commonplace for saints of any era, saints existing long, long uh, after the basic story could be included in a representation of the Holy Family because it's a mystical scene. Okay, thank you. There we go. What was El Greco's personal religion? Ah, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, what was El Greco's uh, personal religion? Um, there's been a good deal of debate about this. When he's in Spain, he declares himself absolutely to be Catholic and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and it's possible that he was on 
Crete as well, and, and devout Spaniards argue that he was always Catholic and, and he was never a member of the Orthodox Church. And we don't know for sure. His baptism is not recorded in the Catholic records on Crete. And I think the clincher for me is the fact that his uncle was a Greek Orthodox priest. And so chances are he was raised in the Orthodox tradition. Now, you have to understand that particularly at this moment, there was a great rapprochement between the Eastern and Western churches. Um, the Protestants by this stage were the least of their worries. They were much more concerned about the Ottomans. And, uh, and so there was a great rapprochement between the Eastern and Western churches. You find in the decade in which El Greco uh, is in Rome, the Pope establishes a Greek college in the city. It's still there on the Via, Via del Babuino in Rome. Um, and so there's a great deal of back and forth at this, uh, at this point. Rather than, than stressing uh, points of divergence, they were stressing points of uh, conjunction uh, at this moment in time. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, uh, the question is, what's, what's the behind the idea of how they look, as in they didn't know how she looked or how the Chuck Christ, religious painters in general, where do they get their imagery from? Is it from their imagination? Do they use models? Uh, is it a combination of both? Yes, it's a combination of both. However, in the tradition in which he grew up, that image that the faithful believed was set down in sittings with the Virgin Mary and the Christ child by St. Luke, held great, great authority. Now, El Greco's later imagery, imagery like, like this, doesn't bear any firm relationship with that type. They're instead coming from his own mind. I think maybe I failed to tell you something very essential, uh, <laughs> and that is, that El Greco's adoption of the manner of style in Italy is he was, he was made to adopt it uh, as, as, a, as, an, uh, as an iconographer because the fundamental principle, we call it mannerism, and it's an ism, therefore, but you must not think of it as a unified art movement. Um, there, I showed you very distinctive expressions of the manner of style depending in part on locale and part, in part on individual personalities. And the basic principle of this style was in the idealizing eye of the artist. Beauty was to be found not in recording natural appearances, but rather through the idealization that an artist could produce. And so that's really what Greco's style is about, is he's seeking to achieve what they called grazia. That, that's the Italian word, it literally means grace. But for mannerist artists, capturing grace, grazia, was about using style to in indicate a beauty of the spirit. And so El Greco, with this background as an iconographer, really latches onto this. And it's meaningful to him because he has such a big personality. He has tremendous self-confidence in himself and his ability um, to convey these, these divine aspects. Um, he was no mystic, but he was very much an artist and a thinking artist. He's born to a family of merchants, and he's very clearly given a good education as a boy. At the time of his death, 130 books in Greek, um, uh, Italian, Spanish, and Latin are found in his library. Now, 130 books for us is nothing, but for a person of El Greco's time, that's a large personal library. And there are books on all sorts of things, from art theory to metaphysics, to Neoplatonism and the metaphysics uh, of light, 
of light being seen as indicating uh, the Godhead. And scholars have begun to mine this a bit, um, but I, I think it, it will develop uh, over the course of time now that we've left El, Gre El Greco as a mystic behind. To me, one of the most uh, evocative parts of this painting is the expression on Mary's face of melancholy foreshadowing that you alluded to. And uh, it's very common in Bellini Madonnas. And I'm wondering, is, did Greco ever make any mention? You mentioned Titian and Tintoretto and some, in any of his thought, did he Not ever mention Not that I'm aware Bellini? of. Not that I'm aware of, but you've got to remember he loved the Venetian school. His emphasis on color is always tied, to, uh, tied back to Venice. And one can imagine him, although Bellini's art, Giovanni Bellini's art, is very distinct from El Greco, one can nonetheless imagine him admiring it uh, and Im ad admiring its spiritual uh, qualities. I, I see in that face not only a bit of sadness, but something of Mary's acceptance of God's will for her and for her child in that face. It's something very subtle that I see, at least. Anyone else? Yes, sir. There is a structure next, next to the feet of the child in red. Would you comment on that? I'm sorry, I don't understand. The, there is a structure next to the feet of the child. It, the, the piece of, of, of red drapery of, of red red. that you're seeing down there? Yes. Um, that's, that's actually a piece of drapery that corresponds to the rose-colored robe uh, uh, of the Virgin the rose-colored dress of the Virgin, and her, her mantle is just parted at that point. Normally, you would find in most painters an indication of body underneath, of, of some support uh, uh, of the Christ child, but here he, he seems to float like the figures him, himself. I don't know if you noticed as we, we were looking at the other holy families, but there's almost always an indication of ground in the foreground, and here he eliminates that. Uh, and it gives the figures this, this kind of floating quality. Yes. Should we take one more, Dawson? Here we go. Okay. Could you say that the use of color so constant, con contrasting makes the figures almost three-dimensional? Yes, th and there's this tension. There's the t this great tension between a kind of three-dimensionality and the emphasis on design on the surface. And that's part of mannerism as well. That's something he very much uh, picks up and cultivates. And even though the Virgin and Mary Magdalene are virtually cheek to cheek, it's very strange the way they're brought into the same, same plane there and juxtaposed. It's not conventional space by any means, and it's certainly not con a conventional play of naturalistic light. Thank you all very much. Enjoy it while it's here. <laughs>